Antarctica Park without technical difficulties. <laughs> uh, this is really exciting for me. Um, it has been a while since we were able to participate in Volcano Awareness. <clears throat> Tonight, we do that again. We've got two great programs for Volcano Awareness Month. Tonight is incredible because many of us are local folks here and went through the Mauna Loa, the recent Mauna Loa eruption, first time in 38 years. So, woohoo! Woohoo! Okay, true confessions. It was about 1 2 o'clock in the morning. I was in bed in the Volcano Gulf and Country Club, and all of a sudden the whole room lit up, and I looked out the upstairs window, and there's a lava flow coming towards us from Mauna Loa. I was Fisher Four. And so I immediately texted everybody. There's Rob and Jody yeah. in the back. I texted them. Jay, I texted him. Janice, the photographer. What's going on? Oh uh, and I told my wife, maybe we should pack an overnight bag. <laughs> Fortunately, Fisher 4 was short-lived and stayed up on the mountain. And then Fisher 3 came down. Yes! Yes. Um, our guests tonight, both heavy hitters here, um, Mike Zoller is a geologist and Geographic Information System Analyst. Is that the correct word? Yes. He's with the U.S. Geological Survey at Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. Uh, Mike tells me he discovered geology while attending Franklin and Marshall College in Pennsylvania, where he quickly fell in love with the subject. He's always been fascinated by geography at an early age. His work with GIS mapping and monitoring stations had, has made him an integral part of HBO's team. Really impressive. Um, I was laughing because I was reading the interview you did, and they were saying, oh yeah, Kilauea is erupting, and the local newspapers are, everybody come to see it, it looks great. And then you look at the national news, and it was, danger, volcano oh, erupts, <laughs> <laughs> everyone's fleeing. And they're like, what? We do that. Uh, so in addition to Mike, we also have Matt Patrick. He is no stranger to our Awesome, I should say Dr. Matt Patrick. He's a research volcanologist since 2007 with Hawaiian Volcano Observatory. He's got a phenomenal history, uh, undergrad from Cornell University, University of Alaska Fairbanks for his master's, and of course, University of Hawaii, Manoa, Manoa for his PhD. You guys have seen him on the news a lot when uh, eruptions are taking place. So two really wonderful folks. We're gonna start. He's, he's going to close with that. Um, but I'm going to start off by um, just giving a little bit of background on Mount Loa. I know a lot, I see a lot of familiar faces in this crowd. I know a lot of people uh, here have probably been to previous After Darks where we talked about both Kilauea and Mount Loa. But for those here in the room and out on, on Hawaii Tracker and, and the internet who may not be so familiar with the volcano, Mount Loa is the largest active volcano in the world. 
Uh, it takes up over 50% of the island of Hawaii, and um, the, the shaded background you see there is the footprint of the volcano and the lava zones that comprise it. Uh, and then the other colors you see there overlaid on the lava zones are uh, the 33 eruptions from 1843 uh, up through 1984 uh, that Palomoa had. So until November of this past year, we, we were saying 1984, March and April was the last Mauna Loa eruption, but we have to start correcting ourselves. It's November, December of 2022 now. Um, that 38 year repose, that 38 year repose period between uh, 1984 and uh, 2022 is the longest repose period in Mount Loa's history. Um, the previous, the closest was between 1950 and 1975. Um, and after a really long period of quiet, one might think something different might happen with this eruption. We might have like a really big one or a really small one. Like it's hard to imagine that the volcano might have like a like a pretty basic eruption after such a long period of quiet, but in fact, as it was to all of us who have seen Mauna Loa erupt for the first time now in several decades, um, the eruption that it had is actually pretty run of the mill if you look back at the geological history of the volcano. And if this eruption had happened 100 years ago, it would probably just be a footnote in the history. But um, I guess I say that to remind us that what we saw there followed a fairly expected pattern for Mauna Loa eruptions, but there are different things that can happen. You have bigger eruptions, you can have eruptions that stay in the summit region. And um, the one that we saw transitioning into the north is a pretty, pretty common um, sequence of events for those northeast rift eruptions. Um, so he, while we still have this map up, I should say that Mount Loa erupts um, primarily from the summit region, but region into either one of the rift zones, the northeast rift zone, as did this eruption, or the southwest rift zone, as most recently happened in 1950. There's also the rift um, most prominently the 1859 eruption in light, light green that extends up towards Ebola Bay on the northwest coast of the island. There's been three radio events in history. Those are not quite as common as uh, summit or rift eruptions, but they do happen, and they can send flows in, in different directions out to uh, south and north Kona. Um, so, now let's start talking about the, the sequence of events that led up to the, the dramatics that we saw in November and December. Um, after 1984, uh, that eruption on the northeast rift zone, Mauna Loa went into an extended period of quiet. That first, the first signs of it reawakening really showed up in '84 uh, with a deep earthquake swarm below the summit, um, and. It was, it was at that time that HEO started to you know, increase its, its awareness of Mount Loa activity, um, and, but it went back to earthquake counts and deformation rates um, in the summit region of the volcano began to pick up again. Um, and it was around that time that we, we transitioned it into the uh, yellow or advisory uh, color code, and we kept it there for a little while, briefly dropped it back down to, to green in around 2018. But then in 2019, earthquake counts started to, to climb again and show that the volcano was definitely in a heightened state of unrest relative to background levels. And then, um, so I guess I should say that the, the plots we're looking at on the left date back to 2000. So that's 2000. That little spike back in, in 2004, that's that deep earthquake swarm. And then, of course, you get the, the more recent activity in the past 10 years over on the right. But on the, the plots on the right, date back to August of 2022. And in those plots, you can see that we were at fairly low levels of earthquake and deformation because the middle plot is the, the line link across the summit of the caldera. And the earthquake counts started to increase um, in, in about mid-September of last year. And it was around that time that HVO uh, and our partners at Hawaii County Civil Defense started to that Mauna Loa might be, you know, ramping up to something here. We, didn't, we weren't ready to predict an eruption with certainty. That's, that's why the volcano stayed at the yellow advisory color code. But we started to suspect that it may be, it may be ramping up to something at that time. Um, but that ramp up continued fairly steadily uh, until the night of November, 20, night of November 27th. 
Um, when I went to bed at 9.30 and everything was pretty much normal on the volcano, at least relative to what it had been doing since September. Um, but in the, the late evening hours, uh, right around 11 o'clock, earthquake counts shot up and we all even transitioned into volcanic tremor. And volcanic tremor is this blue right across the middle of this. Because up at the top, you see background, essentially background levels of activity where hardly any earthquakes are showing up on this seismic helicopter. We transitioned into strong earthquakes and, and tremor, which is essentially, tremor is like vibration of the ground as, as magma pulses through it. And um, so those, those blue areas are, are areas where the, the ground was vibrating with such intensity that it wasn't even possible to pick out individual earthquakes anymore. It was, it, it was all just this single band of tremor. Um, but then as soon as lava broke the surface, which it did at right around 11.21 and 30 seconds, according to, to Matt's uh, webcam videos, um, I'll flip back to that slide, tremor actually decreased a little bit, because the, the lava is not needing to break rock to get to the surface, it's already got its pathway. Um, so lava started erupting at the, at the surface at 11.21 and 30 seconds, and over the course of the next several hours, fissures in the summit region uh, continued to feed Almost the entire caldera floor was covered. Um, and this is, a, this is a photo. I was lucky enough to go with, with my boss, Frank Truesdale, here on the first half of the flight uh, up to the summit that morning. And by the time we got there, that entire area that had been molten just a few hours uh, previously was not erupting and already starting to go over. Um, there was just a little bit of activity uh, at one fissure on the northern end of the caldera, but within a few minutes of us of us being up there in the air, um, it had already settled down. Additionally, um, there was a series of fissures that broke out of the summit caldera and extended to the southwest. Um, those of you who are familiar with the, the uh, geometry, as those three pit craters south of Mokua Veo Veo caldera, uh, extending into the, the upper southwest rift zone region. However, we don't consider this a southwest rift eruption. This is high enough in the in the volcanic edifice, and it didn't extend far enough down the southwest rift beyond this area that we consider still the summit region. Um, and th this area is bounded by a series of cracks that are remnants of the past caldera that was probably much larger in the summit in the summit region prior to the formation of this caldera, and within that footprint. Um, so they're outside the present caldera, but they're still within the bounds of, of what, what the old one would have been. And for that reason, we don't consider it a southwest rift eruption. It's still a summit Now, could these send lava flows in the Kona direction if they, if they erupted long enough? Potentially, they could, they could reach South Kona if it erupted long enough, but this was only active for a few hours. And it did generate a little bit of concern on that first night of the eruption because people in South Kona were looking up and seeing, oh, there's red lava up there. But it stayed pretty close to the vents, only within a couple of kilometers down the slope. Um, did those flows reach, and it was it was inactive by the time that it flew by just after sunrise that morning. So where was the lava? Um, we got we had migrated to the North East Rift, and we had kind of known this from from webcam views before we took off in the helicopter. We could see from our webcam on on the, the south of Mount Kea that looks at the Mount Olo and Northeast Rift zone that fissures had migrated down the Northeast Rift and started uh, erupting in that area. And I boarded the helicopter that morning with the intention of doing all this cool mapping work, like I'm going to take all these photos, and I'm going to get back to the office later and delineate the boundaries of the lava flows when I get back. We got this. Lots of lava. And I, I just like put my head in my hands on the helicopter. Man, we got our work cut out for ourselves. This is a big area. Not, not, not surprisingly. You know, we knew from our webcams that a lot of lava was coming out of the volcano, um, but our webcams are limited on a volcano of this size. So I was only seeing it in person, I realized how daunting of a task it was, it was going to be to keep track of all the activity that was going on up there. But slowly but surely, you just have to start chipping away at it. And so sitting there in the helicopter, I started to focus on where the activity is centered right now. And at that time, there were two eruptive fissures 
11,500 foot uh, elevation on the northeast rim zone. Um, and take, take a good look, good look at the locating myself relative to some of the other cinder cones that I know in that area, having, having mapped with Frank up there in the past. Um, I was able to um, this app that we um, that we've developed here at HBO in the past few years, uh, and plot the fissures and the lot, including this one that's skirting along the edge of the, this this older Kipuka there, into this app so that people back at the HBO office were able to see these points and know where the oak fronts uh, were in real time, because uh, we had set this thing up for Kilauea eruptions previously, and it was fairly easy deploy it from Aloha and, and to tell my coworkers back in the office, like, hey, go look at the map. I've got the points in there. Now you know where the lava flow fissures are. Because um, even if we can't map the whole thing, it's just knowing where the fissures are is, is extremely helpful because we can, based on the topography in our digital elements of the area, potentially project the flow directions down slope and determine where lava might be going, even if we can't map the whole thing. After a couple hours up there and watching that activity at um, those two fissures, which eventually became known as fissures one and two, um, Frank, myself, and our helicopter pilot, David Okita, we noticed this like little source of gas like coming out of a crack like a couple kilometers down the rift zone, a little bit more to the northeast of the creek. A little curious to us, like, that's, that's, that's a little bit more steam than we've seen coming out of the volcano in that area previously. Let's go get a closer look at that. And, we flew over at about 10.49. Within a minute or two, it was already erupting. And this is the very first photo of what eventually became Fissure 3 and fed the majority of the eruption. Um, and it was, it, was a pretty, uh, it was a pretty easy to spot area because it was right next to this, this famous cone up there called Steaming Cone, which is just out of view to the left. And we were able to use that, that cone for camp views and other observations of, of Fissure 3 throughout the eruption. Of course, um, there was a there was a fourth fissure that opened up further downrift. We saw that we saw that later on in our um, our webcam views. Uh, but fissure four kind of died out. Localized here at fissure three, um, and this is a this is a pretty common pattern. As, as I said, all eruptions of Mount Aloha start in the in the summit region and then transition down in either one of the rift zones. This one decided to transition down the northeast rift zone, and after erupting. For a while from a set of linear fissures, it often will coalesce to one event, the spot where the, the, there's the most thermal efficiency to erupt the lava from for an extended period of time. And that's exactly And I have to, I'd have to go back and geolite a little bit more detail to just to be sure, but I have a feeling that the spot where you see the lava coming out right there is exactly where the, the cone was eventually. Um, Extensive lava flow started to emit from this fissure. So, even at, at hindsight is 2020, but even at that time, it seemed like things were going to be pretty active at this at this new spot, uh, and it was going to be a place to keep. As soon as we got back to the office, um, even though I was quite overwhelmed with everything I had seen up there, massive areas that we couldn't quite map, the the, the winds that first. With the lava flows going to the north off the north flank of the rift zone, we couldn't really get to the flow fronts at all. We had to stay up by the fissures themselves. But right as we were leaving, I was able to get like a good glimpse out of the helicopter at the flow front that were like wrapping around an older cinder cone uh, just outside the national park boundary. And that enabled me, as soon as I got back back home and to my home office, to be able to put together this map and at least get the word. Vigorous flow fronts were, and sure enough, that's where the flow continued down the mountain from, and eventually approached Saddle Road. It passed right through those three spots that you see on that map. Now, for the older areas that we wanted to get a better look at and be able to put like nice pretty polygons on the map and say like this is where the lava flows got erupted, that was a little bit of a challenge because this is what most of the satellite views look like. Um, for an eruption covering an area of this size, we're heavily reliant on satellite views, especially um, especially views that are only accessible to the USGS National Civil Applications Center office in Reston, Virginia. That office has a series of analysts who 
specifications and the necessary security clearances to look at classified military satellite imagery. And they handle a lot of the mapping for us and translate it to us so that we can put the pretty polygons on the map. We're not allowed to see the images, though. They're, no, they're not allowed to show those to anybody. This is a publicly available Sentinel-2 image, but they had the same problem as us when looking at all these images. The first few days of the eruption had a high cloud layer. We just couldn't see the ground. So how on earth were we going to map all of this when a huge area had been covered with lava? And I should note that this is almost the opposite way that 2018 in the Lower East Rift Zone played out. That eruption started with small, small lava flows very close to the fissures in Leilani Estates, and then later on it expanded. But with Mount Loa eruptions, the effusion rate and the lava coverage is almost always highest at the very beginning. So you get a huge blanket of lava out on the summit and upper flanks of the volcano, and then it kind of dials itself back slowly over time. So we started to think about like different ways to approach this problem and started to get really creative. Um, because even though the satellite views were not the, the greatest because of those high, um, those high cloud layers that were kind of blocking the, the satellite views, started to think that maybe we could use like our webcams and leverage them a little better to, to plot these flows on our, on our maps. And this is a, a nighttime uh, webcam view of um, the, th this is the Mauna Kea webcam on the south flank of Mauna Kea that looks back at the Mauna Loa northeast rift zone. And that's a nighttime webcam view from November 30th of the lava flows coming down the flank of Mauna Loa. This, and this is a daytime view with exactly the same frame. So as I toggle between these two, everything is located exactly the same place in the frame. And so, by cross-referencing the red lava that we see on the nighttime image with, with features in the daytime images, including some of these older kipukas on the, on the north flank of Mauna Loa, we're able to plot the outline of the lava flow on the map. It's not the most accurate method, but it's better than nothing when we're, when we're a little bit blind in terms of our satellite and other, and other potential um, mapping methods. So, we started to build out the, the maps with using lines like this, and this is, this is the first pretty comprehensive map that we put out on November 30th, including that line of the flow front. And we did get, we did get a little bit of satellite views to fill in some of the gaps of higher up on the mountain, um, on the upper northeast rift zone and back in, back in the summit region. But you'll notice on this map that note in the bottom left, southwestern summit flow is not yet mapped, but all, even though they were all now enacted. Now, how are we going to deal with that? Um, because as time goes on, a lot of our satellite views, and, um, which are both optical and thermal, it was going to be dip more difficult to pick out that flow as a pool. Um, but we decided to leverage a, a, a different method um, in that right here we're looking at an interferogram. And I'm not a geophysicist, so I'm not going to go, I'm, I'm not going to go too wild with um, descriptions of what we're seeing here, but basically what's going on is that satellite flies over the volcano and it shoots a radar image of the ground. And then a few weeks or a few days later, it comes back and shoot, shoots another one. And between those two passes, we can measure the difference in height between the two radar images. And traditionally, HBO has used these to track deformation in the subsurface of the volcano. And the, we put out this map mainly to show the intrusion on the northeast rift zone, where you see the, the uplift and spreading and around fissure three, and the deflation in the sunk magma chamber um, that occurred as lava flushed out to feed the, the northeast rift eruption. But in areas where lava has flowed across the ground, these two radar images get so completely decorrelated that the, the map gets all mixed up. And so you see on this map, each of these fringes so the gap between each magenta line and each magenta line is about half a centimeter. But if, um, if you look at the areas where the lava has actually flowed in, you get, you get thousands and thousands and thousands of those little fringes right on top of each other because the ground is so massively decorrelated that there's no way you could ever compare like slight fluctuations on the order of a couple centimeters. So, we decided to play around with these a little bit and change the color scale. And by doing that, it became super clear, whoa, that's the area where it's decorrelated. That's exactly where the lava flowed in. And so we were able to fill in 
our maps with those southwest risk zone flows by using by using the um, the decorrelation in these interferograms on the southwest side. Sorry, not southwest risk zone flows. Southwest summit flows. They're still in the summit. So as, um, as this eruption progressed into the Sowell region with those flows extending further and further down the north flank of Mount Aloha, um, civil defense um, and, the, and the public started to get super, super concerned about um, whether or not lava was going to threaten Sowell Road. Certainly for several days there, it looked like we, we might have to, have to deal with the, the loss of the highway going across the middle of the island. To track this with more detail, because we started to shift most of our mapping focus to this area. This is the area of greatest concern to the well-being of the island. We started to deploy some other ground-based methods to, to map the flow in this area, including just shooting a basic laser rangefinder measurement from the ground in the Sal Road region. Um, this instrument that we're using here is a Vector 23 that we use for years out here at the summit, um, but it has, it has a massive range up to like 30 kilometers or something. And so we were able to shoot very like, extremely accurate measurements from Saddle Road right to the flow front and then plot those points on a map to better convey to civil defense and, and to citizen scientists out there in the community exactly the distance of the flow to Saddle Road and the rate at which it was advancing. Uh, of course, that rate is slowing because the lava, the lava flow was entering in, into an area with shallower slopes. Naturally, the speed is going is to slow down as it gets into an area with, with not as steep slopes. Um, we also um, began to use that mapping app that I talked about a little bit earlier um, in an even more innovative way because every single morning you would send up helicopter overflight along the, along the flow front and go look at the vent, drop some people off on the ground like Frank to go take lava samples because he likes to do the fun stuff. And we, just, we realized that we could, we could better leverage these flights by having them fly along the flow margin at, at the front there and send those lines back to us in the office and have a really detailed line for the lava flow front as it moved into the saddle region. And so that's what we're looking at right here. This is, this is a series of lines that were collected by people holding their phones in the helicopter while they flew along and traced in the air the outline of the lava flow. And civil defense was so excited when we started sending them these because this was, this was the most detailed but fastest way to get them accurate information on, on the flow progression in, into the saddle. Because as soon as somebody in, in the helicopter pressed the submit button, this went into the cloud and all the people with access to the HBO maps were able to see this in real time. Now meanwhile, up at the vent, um, things, things had stabilized into a pretty, um, pretty pumping Fissure built spatter cone. I'm trying to get this video to play here. There we go. Yeah. So this video was collected by a USGS drone hovering near uh, near Fissure 3 as it erupted on December 4th. Um, so if you remember those those initial pictures I showed of Fissure 3, it was, it was a long line of Mountains, maybe up to a kilometer long, but you can see here it's a much smaller, more compact area because it's kind of localized at that one vent with the most thermal efficiency along the fissure line. And then, of course, you have we have it building up the cone around it with, with spatter and the lava cascade down into the channel. Um, it's almost hard to believe that we're actually looking at like real footage when I look at this. I, I, it's like it's like it's a video game or something. It, you can't actually. Be real. We'll get, to, we'll get to questions at the end. Um, but I, I would say that those, those fountains there are probably on the order of 30 meters tall, maybe up, maybe up to 100. Um, we'll play this just one more time. And actually, if you look on the far right side of the image, you might see a couple of specks down on the ground. That's Frank and my coworker, this this one, who went out there to collect some lava, some molten spatter samples that were, that were coming down the flank of the cone. Now, when we're flying these missions with the drone, of course, we have the permission of Hawaii Volcanoes National Park to, to do this, and we also coordinated with the, the temporary flight restriction that was in place for the area. You notice that we don't actually fly at this height directly over the lava. Because the drone might melt, and also yes. the propellers will lose lift to yes. it. So we try to stay a little bit oblique. If we're higher, we can get a little bit directly over it. But at this height, we're, we're trying to get 
we're trying to get low level oblique images of, of the fissure. Uh, we can't go directly over it. Definitely a little too dangerous. There are more videos later on that we're going to move on from now. Um, from that specific drone flight, um, we also we did some structure from motion mapping, which is a common technique that we use out here at Kilauea to measure the rise of the, the lava lake surface. And this is a technique where with the drone or with the helicopter, you fly in orbits around a certain feature, collect the sequence of images, and then stitch them together uh, in this software called Agisoft Metashape to make a three-dimensional model. And this is the three-dimensional model that we were able to make of the, of the cone um, from the images taken during that flight. You, can, you only see the outside of the cone because inside the cone, with all that lava bouncing up and down, you can't match points between the different images. But everything needs to stay stationary between each of the photographs when, when they get dumped into the software to make the model. So all that stuff that's moving around inside the vent, you can't actually make sense of that in the software. So we're only able to model the outside. But this can be used later on uh, for studies of the morphology of the cone and the way that it got built in terms of um, like thicker spatter in this area, more, tef more airborne tephra um, in certain parts, um, because the vent kind of changes behavior throughout the course of the production. This is another UAS video at higher level. This is about 400 feet above ground level looking directly down on the lava channel. Um, and you'll notice working its way through the lava channel is what we call a lava bird or, or a lava boat, which is probably a big chunk of the cone that broke off um, up at the vent and then rafted its way down the lava channel. It's going to slam right into the wall there and break off to the left. We, we collected this video not for the reason originally of seeing the, the lava bird, but we can use these, we can use these videos um, for what's called particle image velocimetry, where you, you put this in um, software, um, MATLAB, or, or other, um, other image processing software to track points on the surface of the lava channel as they move. We can get very detailed velocity estimates for the channel. Uh, and in this case, we came out to about eight meters per second, the, the rate that it was passing through the channel. Matt's going to talk a little bit later on about the importance of that because we're able to use that in terms of in terms of determining the, the total eruption rate, the volume of lava that's coming out of the vent as the eruption goes on. You'll notice um, there's a fork in the channel here, and then the, the top side, which is which is breaking off a little bit more to the east, um, we're looking kind of kind of southeast in this view. That area was starting to tube over a little bit, and the the, the channel on the west side is becoming a more dominant. Now, that was, that was the mature phase of the eruption that we saw there in those, those drone uh, images. Um, around December 10th, uh, excuse me, around December 7th, um, we still have a, a line of fountains and a full lava channel coming out of the vent, um, pretty similar to what we saw in those drone uh, images. But shortly after that, things started to change a little bit, and there might have been some signs that the eruption was winding down. So, there you, there you have December 7th, I think this is a photo that Matt took. And then the next day, December 8th, we started to see this transition in the vent to the jetty fountains. Super tall and, and a little bit, and occasionally a little bit inclined. You'll notice here that it's shooting a little bit off to the right, and occasionally it went the other way to the left too. It might be a suggestion that the vent is plugging itself. Like the lava that's sitting in the bottom of that cone is sitting right on top of the jet the spot where the jet is trying to come out. It's getting blocked slightly and inclining one way. And this didn't necessarily mean the eruption was definitely ending, but it definitely was a sign that something was different because we hadn't seen this behavior up until that point. Um, these fountains were probably even a bit taller. These were probably up to about 50 meters tall, um, so 100, uh, 150 feet or so. And then right around that time, the, um, the flow front that was approaching Saddle essentially came to a halt. You know, we, were, we were seeing that it was slowing as it entered that area of lower slopes where flat in the saddle region. Um, and as it did that, we started to see little ooze outs and, and overflows from the from the channel breaking off on either side. Um, this you can see that, that red outline there is one of the breakouts that, that came off to the, uh, the east side of the lava channel. That's another sign that things are changing. The, the channel is not as stable anymore. It's not able to maintain flow to the front. 
Um, so the eruption is in a, it's in a transition phase when you see things like this. And then on the 9th, uh, we, have, we have further reduced vent vigor, not even any any jetting fountains anymore, not even any like, major fountains of any kind. A little bit of a, a dome in the back of the vent, which is the, the upper the west side there. Um, but shortly thereafter, even that started to shut down. Um, and the channel began to drain. So we had this, this big, deep crevasse in the area where lava had previously been, been full to the rim and even overflowed at times. And I think Matt has a, has a few videos of those overflows. But at this time, the eruption was winding down. Lava is sitting very deep in that channel. This is the next day, December 10th. And that dome fountain's even gone. You just see a couple patches of incandescent lava on the, on the, the floor there. Um, and not even any like flow coming out. You see the, the crusted lava to the lower right uh, entering into the channel area is all pretty much crusted over and, and black at this point. And sure enough, down slope, only a, a handful of spots of incandescence, which were probably not even connected to the vent anymore. This is probably just stuff that was stuck in the channel and, and was remaining molten for a little, little further distance down the mountain. But by this time, uh, the flow front had pretty much stalled. Um, this is the final map that we put out um, with the eruption ending on this, uh, around, right around December 12th. Uh, there was a little bit of activity still um, at, the, at the fissure even after we saw the last incandescence. A couple of the field crews who were out there for some gas measurements noted some, some loud um, gas explosions while they were up there. Low, low level stuff, not threatening to the crews on the ground. But that, that appears to have been the, the last gas with the eruption. Even, even after all the lava was erupted, there was a little bit of, little bit of gas still coming out propelling its way to the surface through, through the side of the cone. With the eruption ending, um, we were able to pick up some other studies, um, including trying to quantify the total volume of lava that had been erupted throughout the eruption. And the best way for us to do this is by a method called DEM differencing. Um, similar to what we do out here at Hale uh, with those eruptions ongoing, we take one model, one three-dimensional model of the crater floor and compare it with the next one. And in this case, we take the three-dimensional model of Mount Aloha before the eruption and compare it with one after the eruption. And we were able to get this post-eruption model thanks to our friends at NASA who brought this fancy jet out here with a, with, a, with a laser scanner on the bottom called the listing instrument. And through this, we were able to do these DEM comparisons and come up with a map on the right, which is the total thickness of the lava flow. You'll notice that it gets extremely thick down there towards the front, which is approaching Saddle Road. That's because as the flow entered into that area with the shallow slopes, it began to stack up and got really tall. Um, whereas the higher elevation areas, where it's easier for the lava to flow away from itself, are generally a little bit thinner. And from those measurements, we were able to come up with a minimum volume for the eruption of about 150 million cubic meters, mm -hmm. which I think is about 30 billion gallons or so. Um, and you know, we're still working to refine that. There's, 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 some, um, there's some tweaks that we can do to this measurement technique to get a little bit better numbers out of it. Uh, and for that reason, we think this is a minimum. I think it could have been as much as 250 million cubic meters of lava that came out um, based on some of the other methods that we used to measure. At this time, I've talked enough about the mapping stuff. I'm going to hand over to Matt, who's going to talk a little bit about the, the webcams that we use to monitor the eruption, some of the insights that we gained from those. So, Matt. Mm -hmm. surface, there's also gas geochemistry, 
But the geology, uh, of course, it's ideal to be out there in person to see things directly, but we can't be out there 24 7. So we rely uh, very heavily, uh, one of our primary tools is using webcam. So this is the webcam network that HBO maintains on the island. And uh, we have most, you know, all these, all these cameras are on Mauna Loa and Kilauea. Um, many of them are focused around the summit regions, which are you know, more active. Uh, and uh, we have about between 20 and 30. But let's talk about cameras on Mauna Loa. So this is a view of our so this is a view of our cameras on the summit of Mauna Loa. Uh, it's on the Caldera Rim, and on the right we have we have the thermal camera. On the left we have the visual camera. And so let's talk about the eruption. First of all, there was no obvious change on the surface right before the eruption. This is the view uh, early in the after or late in the afternoon. Uh, like Mike said, the eruption started in the middle of the night. Uh, no obvious changes on the surface, no glow or any signs of increased steaming. So obviously that, that magma that came up uh, to feed the eruption did that final stretch uh, pretty quickly. So um, one of the first notifications that I got is I had a little script running on that thermal camera that basically just was set up to send me a picture message when a high temperature was detected. And you know, occasionally I'll get false alarms and whatnot, or just some bad coding and whatnot. Um, but uh, one of the first notifications I got in the middle of the night uh, when I was sleeping was this notification saying, hey, there may be lava. And of course, there was. <laughs> and you can see it's pretty clear. That's why I uh, actually I, I included the picture message because I had so many false alarms, you know, due to bad coding that um, occasionally I didn't know whether it's real or not. But was, so the, the image is basically there at the test, and you can see that's definitely a lava fountain. So this is what it looked like that opening sequence with the thermal camera. Not working. Uh oh. Quick, quick, quick. Ah, okay. Here we go. Yeah, so this is an animation, a time lapse from that thermal camera showing, oh, there's the fountains. So you can see um, fountains start towards the middle of the image and then kind of the fissuring, uh, fissure migrates towards the left side of the image, towards the northeast. And we'll watch that again. So, so from start, some of the fountains were really high. Yeah, so this is a visual camera collecting um, kind of video data. And here you can see some of these really tall fountains. If you've ever been to the Caldera Rim, you've seen the 1940 cone. It's this kind of very large cone of the Caldera floor. These fountains must have been quite enormous because there was, and they looked like they were three or four times as high as, as that cone. Um, so some really high initial fountaining, and then um, and that fissure is kind of slowly over the course of the morning migrated to the northeast. Unfortunately, it was actually frustrating because there was horrible weather, um, yes. uh, really thick fog uh, coming through that in the middle of the night. So uh, it was really hard to see what well, was possible to see the actual onset. So this video is from like 10 minutes later. Okay, so once the eruption started, uh, we obviously wanted to put out more cameras to kind of focus on the eruption uh, event area. And luckily, just, uh, we had purchased uh, a large number of cameras exactly for this kind of task, exactly for a rapid monolithic response. So we had this gear on the shelf, ready to go, tested, and we practiced with it. Uh, and so we had a number of cameras here, you see on the top, and uh, solar panels here for power, and little tripods set up. Um, pretty portable, we can throw it in a big duffel bag, throw it in a helicopter, and then you know, go out and set up a bunch of these. And actually, I think we set up a total of 17 cameras for this eruption. Or most of them were temporary, of course. Uh, but that gave us you know, views from many different angles and uh, really allowed us to document the eruption well. And this is a view from, this is an example of one of those cameras. This is a cellular camera that's set up looking at picture three from the south. And that camera, 
uh, is collected here is a time lapse. You can actually see some geologists walking around the lower left. Now this is uh, Fisher III in the later days of the eruption, uh, December 7th and the 8th. It's already built this cone. And you can see on the, kind of the right side of the cone, you can see the fluctuations in that fountain, sometimes overflowing onto the uh, mic of the cone. And particularly on December 8th, Mike was talking about the really high fountains uh, that were really impressive, and you can start to see them here towards the middle of the day. Yeah, right there. And then shifting ground, obviously, in the winds, and with uh, potential you know, blockages of the vent uh, directing the, the, the fountain. But yeah, this gives you a sense of, uh, of how we can document these uh, fluctuations, and you can see that it's really not steady. This is another time lapse that's on north, looking toward the south here, you can, on the right side you can see the fissure, but then here's the upper section of the channel. And again, what you see is this isn't steady, this is, you know, there's kind of surges that come through the, the channel. And of course these have ramifications for how uh, the supply is to the front of the flow. So it's important to monitor these fluctuations to be able to anticipate uh, what might be happening at the flow front. This, these kind of fluctuations were typical in the later, the last couple days of the eruption. So we have cameras set up. Here's a time lapse image uh, of the channel there, the upper section of the channel. Again, it's important to monitor uh, the channel for looking at uh, the, how steady the flow is so we can anticipate what's going to be supplied to the flow front. Um, but one limitation of this is that when you have these still images that are collected every minute or, or two, you can't really measure the velocity through channel, right? So uh, the, those images are spread too far apart to be able to kind of match features. So one of the things that we were testing is a uh, video lapse, and which is basically a camera that's set up to collect a small video, a uh, short video clip, say 20 seconds long, um, and it'll do that every 15 minutes. So we have a nice record of basically these, uh, of the, and so from the video lapse, from the video clips, then you can measure velocity, as Mike was talking about. And why do you do that? Well, it's because it can give you insight on the eruption rate. So the eruption rate is just the volumetric eruption rate is one of the most fundamental parameters for a lava flow. It's one of the most important inputs into a lava flow simulation. Obviously, it's just like a river. One of the most important things you want to know is the flow rate, right? And so this is the USGS graphic showing how you measure the flow rate to a river, which is pretty basic. You just estimate the, well, you know the width from your mapping, you estimate the depth, make some assumptions about that. But what you really, one of the biggest variables is the velocity. So in the old days, what people would, what HBO scientists would do is they'd use, um, they throw a stick up uh, in the upper part here and then use a stopwatch to measure how long it took to, to you know, traverse some span of the channel. And it's actually, this is uh, Winnie the Pooh's, <laughs> this is Winnie the Pooh's favorite game. It's called Pooh Sticks. So, throwing it in, watching how fast it goes down the screen. So, you know, that was the old session. Actually, I was in the warehouse the other day, and I found an old canvas bag that was full of little sticks, and those were the blue sticks that we used. <laughs> but now we can get more sophisticated, right? So, um, now we have the video data, so we can actually use the computer algorithms to track the, um, the velocity through the channel. Uh, we don't need you know, Winnie the Pooh to throw a Pooh stick into the stream, and in fact, if he was actually that high off the channel, he and his friends would probably be combusted. But, <laughs> yeah, so it's obviously uh, allowing us uh, to kind of keep a safe distance if we need to. But to give you a sense, sometimes there are, um, there's value in approaching the channel. Obviously, there's a lot of value that you can approach safely. So this gives you a perspective of what the channel looked like from the rim. And this is a large long boat, you know, this is the size of a school bus that's coming down the channel. Oh. Um, and this, yeah, the flow velocity here is uh, about, uh, here is about six cubic meters per second. Or six, six meters per second, sorry. Um, 
But what I forgot to say is that I wanted to show some of our, you know, the initial results. Mike was talking about velocity of 8 meters per second, another you know, channel width about 12, depth estimated about 3 meters. You can get that from when the channel drains post eruption. That gives you a, a few hundred cubic meters per second, but then you have to correct for the fact that the lava is very frothy in this section. It's got lots of bubbles. Once you take out the bubbles, then we're talking about uh, a volumetric eruption rate of about 100 cubic meters per second. So that's a lot. There's not many volcanoes that you know, have lava flows that are pumping out 100 cubic meters per second. Um, how many of you in, in the old days uh, hiked to uh, the Pu'o'o lava flow that, to see the Hoi Hoi flows? You know, kind of slowly moving across the coastal plain. Yeah, many of you, many of you did, right? So you saw how kind of um, those were pretty nice because you know the, the eruption was very tame. It was easy to approach the flow. Uh, the flows were not moving very fast. So for, for reference, Pu'o'o in those days was erupting um, typically three to five cubic meters per second. So uh, yeah, and that's producing these kind of slow moving oyoi flows. When you get up to 100 cubic meters per second, this is when you're talking about these huge kind of lava rivers. So the other thing um, that we experimented with was installing a live stream camera. And this was a challenge. This is a remote area. It was hard to get a good, reliable uh, data connection. Uh, now here's the camera set up. Uh, Pantel zoom camera, power station here with car batteries and a telephone case, so solar powered. Um, we did manage to get a connection. There were some, you know, it was a challenge because of the location. The connection did drop out some a bit. Um, but we learned a lot from the experience, I think. And we had this running on YouTube for a while. And I should say, we have a current live stream for the lava lake that's not here. Um, you can actually, there's a link to it here in the upper right. But um, that's been going very reliably since the eruption started. So uh, obviously, we have you know, better connection Summit. So, yeah, this was pretty cool to pre provide kind of a live stream for the public. Obviously, this is really valuable for outreach and it's an excellent way to get people engaged in the eruption and really get an intuitive feel for what's going on on the volcano. Oh, and then in December, yeah, there was there was some pretty heavy wind. You saw in that video, that live stream, that the image was kind of shaking around. There was a lot of wind up there, and when we came and found to the setup to retrieve it, it's knocked over. It's impressive because there's car batteries in that telephone okay, case, so yeah, heavy. So another way that we use cameras to monitor the eruption was to monitor, basically map out the flow. Um, and we did that with thermal mapping. And this is something that we did a lot in 2018, so we had a lot of practice. Basically sitting in the helicopter, flying around the flow, collecting still images, and then using that structure for motion software, each of those little lines um, it's basically an individual image, and the software kind of stitches that and mosaics it into a thermal map. So we're able to kind of make a thermal map of the flow, and then we're able to see how that flow evolved. And we can see details, you know, thermal map is cool because you can see details in kind of the channel geometry. So, you know, this is just one single lobe at the front, but it's fed by not just a single channel, but a kind of a network. And it's really important to see how that network is evolving as the eruption evolves. Uh, because that's going to determine kind of the efficiency of supply to the front and what you're really looking for, or any of these channels that might kind of breach and create a new lobe or a new, you know, basically flow in a different direction. So mapping it out with this kind of detail uh, is really valuable for hazard forecasting. And yeah, you can look at the details of the channel. Uh, you can see like some of these channels are getting abandoned. We have uh, in the upper right here, we have some kind of blockage that's created an overflow. Um, again, it's telling the story of how the, the supply and the channel network is evolving, and that's going to impact how, um, how efficient the supply is to the flow front, which is obviously you know, the main hazard concern. And uh, yeah, a lot of these lessons from the thermal mapping and mapping out the channel network, these are you know, lessons that we learned uh, in the 2018 model flow. So yeah, there was a lot of instability. There were a lot of fluctuations in the flow. This is a video taken from the camera on Mauna Kea, looking at the, uh, looking at the channel, and you can see these kind of surges coming through. Um, and then you can see kind of the flow front uh, slowly migrate. So anyway, I think we're good on time.
758. Um, that's all I want to talk about cameras. And uh, just another reminder here with other programs in the Volcano Awareness Month. And if you have any questions, Mike is here to answer them for you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, thank you for coming out tonight. And as, as many of you, I'm sure, it's very obvious that it's great to love doing mm -hmm. this summit. Apples and oranges, but you know how high the fountain is that we'd be looking at over here tonight. So I, I measured it. Um, that, that, uh, sorry, the question was um, how high is the fountain um, at Kilauea Summit right now? And um, last week I measured it with a laser rangefinder, and it was about six meters, so six yards high. So and the other one was 150 at times. Oh yeah, yeah, just Woo. yeah. Totally. <laughs> Any correlation between earthquake activity in Mahala and the Mauna Loa eruption? Um, I'm not aware of any. Yeah, the, I think the Mahala trends have been kind of much longer term. But, uh, I think the, the Mahala earthquake started picking up around like 2018 or so, whereas the Mauna Loa ramp up really, in hindsight, looks like it began in 2015. And with Mahala being deeper, if there was a connection, you kind of expect Mahala to it was actually the first. It was the, the summit of Mount Aurora showing the earthquakes before the Mahalo. So, <coughs> do Yeah, yeah. So, uh, the question was about work at AVO. Uh, yeah, I wanted to get my master's up there. Uh, I worked, uh, yeah as a graduate assistant for Alaska Volcano Observatory. And it's, it's neat having the different experiences that Hawaiian Volcano Observatory and Alaska Volcano Observatory. The monitoring is done very differently. Uh, you know, with Alaska, many of those, most of those volcanoes are out in the Aleutian chain, so they're very remote, so there's heavy reliance on satellite data. And uh, so your field work is really just kind of a narrow window in, in the summer months, and um, you may, which may or may not allow you to get close uh, to the eruption. And of course, they were a deal and a big commitment to, to get out to the Aleutian. Um, here, everything is so accessible. Uh, you saw that video of us standing at the channel rim, you know, basically, you know, right up uh, in front of the lava. So, yeah, different experiences, different styles of monitoring, but, um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I learned a lot in, in both locations. Yeah. How high was the front of the lava? Yeah, I think some of the measurements, Mike, correct, Mike can correct me. Um, I think some of the measurements were as high as 20 meters. Yeah, so 20 yards, 20 yards 60 feet or so. So pretty thick. I mean, you saw the, the flow was coming down into those flats. It's also cooling, so it's thickening, you know, becoming more viscous. So it's, it's just kind of piling up and thickening in that distal part. <coughs> yep. Um, I was in NOAA Observatory last year, and I did. Yeah. It, it, the facility itself wasn't damaged, but the road acts, the road was covered in multiple locations. So, and I don't know what the, the, what the plans are for reestablishing that. But um, yeah, the facility is intact. It's just the access, obviously, that was cut off, and over you know quite a long span of that road. So, you got time for one more question, Matt, and then we'll let people come. Do okay. you guys agree to hang around for a little while? Sure. Yeah, we'll be here. Let's do one more. 
First, changes at the summit of Kilauea since 2018, and of course, a lot of rapid changes going on recently. And that's with geologist Drew Downs. Is that right? Sounds good. Um, I also want to do a shout out to thank uh, Katie Mulligan with USGS. She helped organize this whole thing for Volcano Awareness Month. So, super great. <laughs> I did run out and check. Not only are there fantastic views of the stars tonight, but the volcano is erupting beautifully. So if you want to do that, great. Otherwise, come on up and say hi to the guys and ask them your questions. Mahalo. All right, guys, that's going to conclude our show for tonight. Thank you for joining us at After Dark in the Park at the uh, Hawaii Volcanoes National Park. Thank you all who joined us. Hit that thumbs up. Have a good night, everybody. Noah. <laughs>